Hello and welcome to my next video on the lungs. Now the lungs are an exchange surface. Why do we need exchange surfaces? Well because we need to absorb useful products into our body such as oxygen, glucose, water and we need to remove metabolic waste such as carbon dioxide. Now, small organisms do not need exchange surfaces or transport systems, such as the circulatory system. But larger organisms do. The reason for this is the classic cube example. You have a cube length, just one arbitrary unit, so one by one by one. The surface area is six, because there are six faces. One times one for each, six times one is six. Volume is one, because one times one times one equals one. So the surface area to volume ratio is 6 to 1. If you increase the length of the cube to 2, you get a surface area volume ratio of 3 to 1. If it's 3 for the length, 2 to 1. And if you get up to 10, it becomes 6 to 10, which is 3 to 5, which means that the surface area is smaller than the volume. Now, what this actually means is that for a small organism, it's got a large amount of surface to get all the molecules in for its relatively small volume. As the organism increases in size, its volume increases, but its surface area doesn't increase as much. For example, if you look at the 1 by 1 by 1 cube and the 10 by 10 by 10, the length has increased by times 10, the surface area has increased by times 100, but the volume is increased by times 1000. So the volume is increasing a lot quicker than the surface area is, which means if you're trying to get all these molecules in, let's say oxygen, the surface area wouldn't be able to get enough oxygen in for the whole organism, particularly towards the centre. So for us, for example, you'd get enough oxygen on the skin, but near the heart, we wouldn't get enough if we didn't have a transport surf system and exchange surface. Now, good exchange surfaces need a few certain things. They need a large surface area to get as much of that useful substances in as possible. A thin barrier to re reduce diffusion distance. If you really want to speed things up, diffusion will occur over a very small distance of literally nanometers, as opposed to perhaps going through a whole cell, which is, as you know, about 40 micrometers. You need a fresh supply of molecules for a concentration gradient. So to build up that concentration gradient on one side of the exchange surface you need a high concentration so you need a fresh supply of all those molecules and on the other side you need to get rid of those molecules so you've got a low concentration on one side high concentration on the other so you've got a diffusion gradient now in us animals um, the obvious exchange system for oxygen is the lungs. Now we need oxygen for respiration and um, living essentially and as I said if we didn't have oxygen going through a, an exchange surface then our skin would get enough oxygen but our inner core body wouldn't and that's the important bit. So the lungs you have obviously nasal and mouth passages that's where you breathe in oxygen, or breathe in air rather, and it will go down your trachea. So that's the big windpipe. The trachea will then split off into two bronchi. The two bronchi then split off into many bronchioles. The bronchioles become smaller and smaller and smaller, and then you reach the alveoli, which are kind of like little balls. Now, you will have thousands upon thousands of these um, alveoli so they are only about 100 to 300 micrometers across but there's so many of them which means that the total surface area of a lung is about 70 meters squared that's half the size of a tennis court so that's a massive surface area to volume ratio so that provides a large surface area the alveoli lung capillaries are one cell thick and are right next to each other. So you have, an, you have the alveoli which contains squamous epithelium which is a very thin cell anyway. It's one cell thick and then right next to that you have a capillary running along it. So you breathe in air, 
You've got your oxygen in your alveoli. Go down the track here, bronchi, bronchioles, alveoli. It's in the little balls now. And what you do is the oxygen will diffuse from the inside of the alveoli across the essentially two cell thick wall because you've got one cell on the alveoli, one on the capillary, and into the blood. That's a very short distance. So we have the large surface area and the short diffusion path. Now the supply of oxygen. Now, as you breathe in, we'll look at how breathing works a bit later, but as you breathe in, you get a very rapid supply of oxygen. So you have a constant supply of oxygen there, but in the capillary, you have a constant movement of blood, which is pumped very quickly away. So it means you end up getting deoxygenated blood with no oxygen in it, arriving at the alveoli picks up oxygen down the diffusion gradient because you have a high concentration in the alveoli, low concentration in deoxygenated blood, and then the blood becomes oxygenated and very quickly goes away. So you reduce the concentration gradient in the blood, which is good. Cells and tissues, there's a number of cells and tissues to do with the respiratory system. Goblet cells, now these secrete mucus and they work with the ciliated epithelium or cilia. The cilia will waft the mucus, which will trap bacteria, dust, anything you don't want getting into your lungs. And it will waft it to your back of your throat and you'll swallow it, digest it and get rid of anything bad. Elastic fibers. Now these are particularly important on the alveolar, but important on all. They are elastic, makes sense. So what they do is they can expand, increasing the volume and then recoil. So they'll kind of suddenly retract, pushing air out. Very important to use the word recoil. We'll look at why they're important a bit later. Smooth muscle, this controls diameter. It can relax and become wider, increasing the diameter of the trachea in particular. Or it can contract and become thinner. So that is quite important, for example. For example, if it is you're breathing in a high concentration of carbon monoxide, if you can strict and contract the smooth muscle, the airway is not going is not going to be as high as it was before, so you get less of that toxic gas into you. And also it can be quite important if you're running and you need to get more oxygen into you so you can um, increase the size of the diameter. Now the area inside the trachea, the bronchi, the bronchioles, that's the lumen. You'll see that a bit later when we do um, blood vessels. So that's smooth muscle and then rings of cartilage. We'll look at this later um, in tr transporting plants, but cartilage has a very similar effect as lignin in xylem vessels. In fact, in when I was doing F211 last year in January, the first paper I did, we got three mark question, what is the role of lignin in xylem vessels? Next question, was the role of cartilage in the trachea, which essentially had the very almost exactly the same answer. It was a very stupid extra three marks, but it was pretty much the same answer. They provide strength, support, prevent collapse of the airways. Because when air pressure decreases, it will stop it collapsing. But it doesn't form a complete ring, it forms a kind of C shape, as you'll see a bit later. And this just allows a bit more flexibility. So now, trachea, I'm just going to give a kind of rundown of what each of these sections have. Trachea, that is the C-shaped cartilage, smooth muscle, elastic fibres, goblet cells and cilia. Next, bronchi, they have small pieces of cartilage but not in the C-shape. They have smooth muscle, elastic fibres, goblet cells and cilia. Bronchioles, now this pretty much except the smallest bronchioles, normal bronchioles, smooth muscle, elastic fibres, goblet cells and cilia. As bronchi, the bronchioles decrease in size, you'll stop getting goblet cells. And as they become the smallest they can be, you'll get no cilia either. And you'll also get no smooth muscle. And then finally, the alveoli. This, you just have elastic fibre. And, of course, the uh, squamous epithelium. There's no cilia, no goblet cells, no smooth muscle, no cartilage. Breathing. Now, taking in air is inspiration, breathing out air is expiration. So, a few things you need to know. Intercostal muscles and the diaphragm. Now, if you think of how the ribcage works, intercostal muscles are on the kind of stuck to the outside of the ribs. 
so they'll be outside the lungs the diaphragm is underneath so if you kind of think of it like like a semicircle your diaphragm will be underneath your rib cage as a line and then it kind of curves up the same shape same shape as your ribs and then there'll be a little gap at the top obviously for the tracheid to come down so the intercostal muscles and the diaphragm muscles contract when you're breathing in this causes the rib cage to move up and outwards um, I remember in a GCSE exam I got a similar question on this and I spent about a minute breathing just to check where the rib cage went so if that works works so you as you breathe in you always naturally feel as you're going up and your rib cage is going outwards the diaphragm flattens all this does is increases the volume in the thorax that's your chest now as if you do physics and gas laws and stuff as pressure decreases that causes sorry as volume increases pressure will decrease because you'll have the same amount of molecules in a bigger space so there'll be less pressure now as the pressure decreases this creates a pressure gradient so air will flow in so you, as you're breathing in you expand increase the volume decrease the pressure and suddenly lots of air will flood in now this is an active process it requires energy in the form of ATP then expiration the intercostal muscles and diaphragm muscles relax this causes the rib cage to move downwards and inwards the diaphragm curves up this decreases the volume now you have the same amount of molecules in a le in a smaller space so the pressure increases and the air is forced out of the lungs now this is where the elastic fibers come in handy because in your alveoli your trachea or bronchi as you breathe out what they'll do is they will recoil suddenly and will help the air be pushed out so the pressure the pressure gradient with going out so you have a high pressure in your thorax low pressure outside will cause air to naturally go out down its gradient but the recoil just makes it a little bit faster and a little bit stronger to make sure you get rid of all that carbon dioxide one thing I forgot to mention obviously oxygen is going into your blood in deoxygenated blood in your alveoli the capillaries you will have carbon dioxide diffusing from the capillaries into the alveoli and is then forced out in expiration this is a passive process it does not require oxygen um, energy sorry in the form of ATP you do need oxygen that's quite important lung volume now you measure lung volume using a spirometer now a spirometer has an oxygen filled chamber with a movable lid the person breathes through a tube connected to the oxygen chamber as the person breathes in and out the lid of the chamber moves up and down these movements are recorded by a pen attached to the lid of the chamber they write on a rotating drum creating a spirometer trace now you've all seen that's kind of that just one that goes up and down it's the same sort of idea when you have in like sci-fi films when ghosts arrive you have that kind of pen moving very quickly is that sort of idea that makes sense now some safety things they might ask you how can you make it safe you need to use soda lime that absorbs co2 because you don't want people to be breathing in co2 sterilize the mouth piece and use medical grade oxygen not just any old oxygen also make sure the person has no breathing difficulties heart problems or any other medical faults and this is the kind of trace you get which is very badly drawn now a few definitions tidal volume is the volume of air moved out of the lungs with each breath when you are at rest it's approximate, approximately 0 0.5 dm cubed a dm cubed is a litre so half a litre and provides the body with enough oxygen for its resting needs vital capacity is the largest volume of air that can be moved into and out of the lungs in any one breath is approximately 5 dm cubed or 5 litres but varies for loads of region, reasons so if you're a smoker you will have a decreased one um, if you're unhealthy dietary problems you'll have a decreased obviously if you're smaller in stature you will also have a decreased um, vital capacity but equally if you are tall um, if you are someone who does a lot of sport who does singing anything that uses breath a lot you will have a higher vital capacity um, residual volume that's at the bottom 
is the volume of air that remains in the lungs even after the biggest possible exhalation is about 1.5 dm cubed no i've made it look about one it's about 1.5 liters you cannot breathe that out because if you did your lungs would end up collapsing and you would die so that's not good um dead space is the air in the bronchioles bronchi and trachea there's no gas exchange between the air here but that's not shown in the lung capacity trace inspiratory reserve volume is how much air can be breathed in over and above the normal tidal volume so for example now this is the amount of air that can be breathed in above the normal tidal volume so you breathe in like that and then you can go breathing that a little bit more expiratory reserve volume is the amount of air you can breathe out after you've breathed out so you go that's tidal and then even more because I'm sure you wanted to hear me breathe now one thing I've just seen which might be considered a little bit confusing now looking at the trace the expiratory reserve volume is at the top and that's increasing the volume as you breathe out inspiratory reserve volume is decreasing the volume that's because the volume is measured as the volume in a spirometer so if you think you breathe into spirometer and then it goes into that oxygen little tank and the lid moves up and down if you breathe out the lids will go up so the pen will go up so if you breathe out even more the lid the pen will go up even more so don't think there's the volume of air in your lungs it's the air in the spirometer and finally gradient if you can see right at the right hand side the little triangle that's the gradient the gradient equals oxygen consumed per minute because it starts decreasing your tidal volumes of how much air is in the spirometer. Since carbon dioxide is being taken in by the soda lime, the actual amount of air each time you breathe in and out will decrease because you're using oxygen. You will So you take in oxygen, use it, release carbon dioxide. The carbon dioxide is absorbed by the soda lime, so you decrease the air and you can work out how much oxygen you consume per minute and the overall thing is the total lung capacity which is usually about 6.5 dm cubed and that's that in conclusion we need exchange surfaces and transport systems particularly because of larger organisms have a very small surface area to volume ratio we have the lungs for gas exchange you have the trachea bronchi bronchios and alveoli and you can measure your lung capacity using a spirometer so thank you for watching as usual comment like subscribe if you have any questions email me or message me on youtube or whatever so thank you for watching and goodbye